Hey everybody, welcome back. Today we're going to return to the Courtesan Session programs from AUA 2017. Case number two is myocardial infarction on androgen replacement therapy. The next case is uh, moderated by Dr. Cully Carson, myocardial infarction on androgen replacement therapy. Great, thank you very much. I think you'll find this case interesting because as you all know, the uh, 1-800-ATTORNEY uh, advertisements on, the, on, on, uh, on television have, have addressed this very issue on a number of occasions, and there are cases currently uh, in, in action with this particular uh, issue involved. So the patient that we're going to talk about is a 63-year-old man referred by a urologist, uh, referred to a urologist by his primary care physician for failure of, of phosphodiesterase type 5 inhibitors for erectile dysfunction. He reports that a maximum dose of, of sildenafil and tadalafil don't work even, even with those maximum doses, and he reports erectile dysfunction for three years with a lack of interest in sex and general loss of interest and energy. He gained 80 pounds in the past five years with early type 2 diabetes, and he's treated with oral medications for his diabetes. He has some family history of cardiovascular disease. In fact, his father had a myocardial infarction at age 52. His physical examination shows a pretty normal heart rate, slight hypertension, height of 70 degrees, and a weight of 223 pounds, so he's a bit overweight. His GU exam is normal. His laboratory studies as part of his evaluation for his erectile dysfunction include a PSA of 2.4, a testosterone of 210, a hemoglobin of 14.6, and a hematocrit of 45.2. The plan is then to restore his testosterone and retry the PD-5 inhibitors, so he's prescribed testosterone cypionate, 200 milligrams every other week uh, intramuscularly. Insurance won't cover the gels, so he doesn't have an option for gels. So the patient's wife, who's a nurse, has agreed to administer the injections every other week, and uh, sildenafil is, is, is retried at a, a maximum dose of 100 milligrams as needed. Well, he receives three injections. He starts to feel better. He feels better about his life, and he resumes exercise. And while on a brisk morning walk, the patient sustains an acute chest pain, which radiates to his left inner arm. He's taken immediately to the emergency room uh, as soon as he returns home and find, found to have an acute myocardial infarction. He's, dis he's hospitalized as a result of this, but despite acute stenting and coronary care unit care, the patient expires on hospital day three. If, if uh, uh, Mr. Casti, if you would like to um, start with your uh, defendant, Dr. Lindgren. Okay, we'd like to call Dr. Uh, Mark Lindgren, please. Good afternoon, Dr. Lindgren. Uh, doctor, would you please tell us uh, why Mr. Moore initially came to see you? He was referred to me by his primary care physician. Mr. Moore had been experiencing erectile dysfunction for three years. And along with a lack of interest in sex and persistent fatigue, uh, his primary care physician had attempted to address Mr. Moore's symptoms, but his condition hadn't improved. So he came to me in hopes that he might have more success under the care of a specialist. Uh, did you believe that Mr. Moore was discouraged at the time that he came to see you? Uh, yes, I, I think he was quite discouraged. He had already tried the maximum dosages of sildenafil and tadalafil, but neither of these medications had helped his uh, ED. He reported that he had quit exercising some time ago because of his fatigue and he gained weight over the past few years uh, to the point that he had to buy new clothes, which was distressing to him. He was generally not feeling vigorous uh, or good about himself, but he wanted to get back to the point where he could enjoy sex with his wife again and regain some of his lost energy as well. What did you do in order to diagnose Mr. Uh, Mr. Moore? Uh, in addition to obtaining a full history, I performed a physical exam, including genitalia, and ordered standard labs. Uh, what did your history and physical examination reveal? Well, Mr. Moore was overweight and mildly hypertensive in the office. He also had been found to have early signs of type 2 diabetes and was taking oral medications prescribed by his PCP. Uh, but the ED symptoms he had been experiencing for, uh, for so long and his low testosterone level of 210 nanograms per deciliter led me to conclude that testosterone therapy could potentially restore his sex drive. Um, it could boost his energy and perhaps put him on, a, on track to a healthier lifestyle. So did you recommend testosterone therapy for the patient? 
I did. Uh, Mr. Moore and I discussed the benefits, risks, potential side effects, and alternatives to testosterone therapy, uh, and he decided he wanted to give it a try. So I prescribed testosterone, Cipionate, 200 milligrams uh, every other week. <coughs> His wife, who happened to be a nurse, was willing and able to administer the injections. I also told him that he could retry the sildenafil, 100 milligrams as needed. <clears throat> Dr. Lindgren, when you discuss the risks and potential side effects of testosterone therapy with Mr. Moore, what information did you provide to him? Well, I used my standard informed consent form for uh, testosterone therapy. Uh, the form lists the known risks and side effects associated with testosterone therapy, rel ranging from relatively minor risks such as acne or hair thinning to more significant risks such as blood clots or cardiovascular events. Did you advise Mr. Moore of the risk of cardiovascular <coughs> problems associated with testosterone therapy? Uh, yes. Per the standard consent form, I advised him that testosterone therapy could lead to increased risk of developing blood clots, heart attack, stroke, and death. While you were in the room discussing this with uh, Mr. Moore, did you believe that he understood the risks as you communicated them to him? Uh, yes, I believe so, and he signed the form indicating specifically that he understood and accepted the risks. And after that discussion, Mr. Moore opted to proceed with the testosterone therapy? That's correct. What happened after you prescribed the testosterone uh, cipionate? Well, Mr. Moore initially responded to the treatment quite well. Uh, he had received three injections and reported he was feeling better, had more energy, increased sex drive, and even started exercising again. Unfortunately, Mr. Moore experienced chest pain while taking a walk one morning, and upon arriving at the ER, he was diagnosed with an acute MI. And is that one of the uh, risks that you had discussed with him, that is cardiovascular complications? Yes, it is. What happened next? Uh, well, he was admitted to the hospital, and despite receiving care in the uh, CCU, Mr. Moore passed away on day three of his hospitalization. Dr. Lindgren, do you believe it was reasonable for you to prescribe testosterone therapy for the patient, given his physical condition and his family history of cardiovascular disease? Yes, I do. Um, testosterone therapy is not without risks, but Mr. Moore and I discussed both the risks and benefits of therapy at some length. Mr. Moore felt his symptoms were affecting his quality of life in significant ways, including his inability to have sex his lack of energy and subsequent lack of exercise, uh, his significant weight gain, which possibly uh, led to his type 2 diabetes. He felt these symptoms uh, and their sequelae were not only affecting his physical health, but his mental health as well. Uh, he indicated that overcoming the erectile dysfunction meant a great deal to him, and we ultimately concluded together that the potential benefits of testosterone therapy outweighed its associated risks. Thank you, doctor. May I? Yes, sir. Can we agree, sir, that he wanted an erection and he got death? <laughs> he wanted an erection and he got death. True or false? <laughs> There's perhaps more to it than just the erections. All right. When he first came to see you, I take it you examined him? Yes. You got a history? Yes. And you did some routine tests and lab work, true? Yes, true. He was hardly the picture of health. Can we agree on that, sir? Uh, well, as I've said, he was overweight and experiencing some other health challenges, but there were no absolute contraindications for testosterone therapy. Sir, he was close to a train wreck, wasn't he? <laughs> Do you know what a train wreck is? Withdrawn. Continuing. He was quite overweight, wasn't he? He had a BMI of 32. That's not a BMI you'd want, correct? Correct? <laughs> correct. Okay. And he was experiencing fatigue? Yes. And he was diabetic? Uh, yes, controlled with medication. And elevated blood pressure? Yes, we measured 150. 152 over 88 in my office. Uh, he was not taking medication for high blood pressure, uh, but he's being followed by his primary care physician. It's not uncommon to get higher numbers than normal when presenting to a new doctor. And there was a family history of heart disease, correct? True. 
do you hear the train rumbling down the track now? You still think he was the picture of health and not a train wreck? I'll withdraw that. At what tender age did his daddy die of a heart attack? Well, I, I don't believe he passed away. He had a heart attack at the age of 52. Okay. And even with all that, you wrote the prescription, huh? Yes. As I said, there were no absolute contraindications. Uh, he had never experienced cardiac symptoms. Simply, he had this uh, family history of cardiovascular disease. I screened Mr. Moore for cardiac symptoms, such as shortness of breath, uh, shortness of breath on exertion, angina, palpitations, or dizziness. He had none of these. By the way, when were you last board certified in cardiology, sir? <laughs> I am not. When did you last give grand rounds in cardiology, sir? I have not. And when did you last publish an article on cardiology, sir? Never. Well, I have published on the health risks of testosterone. Are you a cardiologist? No. Did you refer Mr. Moore, the decedent, to a cardiologist prior to prescribing the testosterone? I discussed the possibility with him. Discussed the possibility with him because you knew he was at risk, correct? Well, I, don't I didn't require him to see a cardiologist. We discussed the risks and benefits, and ultimately I left it up to his discretion whether to see a cardiologist. And if you did require him, we wouldn't be here today, correct? I'll withdraw that. So he didn't, you didn't require him to visit a cardiologist. Would you agree that a cardiology consult might have revealed that your patient suffered from cardiovascular problems that made him a terribly poor candidate, a terribly poor candidate for this kind of treatment, sir? Um, well, in the absence of any symptoms, I could only speculate what a cardiology consult would reveal. You'd agree, though, that a cardiologist would be in a better position than you to make such determinations. True? Uh, as a doctor, I'm qualified to perform basic cardiac screening, as I did with Mr. Moore. The results didn't indicate a cause for concern. My question is different. The question is whether a cardiologist who specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of cardiovascular disease would be in a better position than a urologist to identify cardiovascular problems. It's possible, but again, I could only speculate what a cardiology consult would have shown in this case. And by the way, you're aware of the fact that the expert who come and testify against you is Dr. John Mulhall. You're aware of that? I am. He is one of the greats in American urology, true? <laughs> he would tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing further. <laughs> All right. Mr. Doff, you can call your first witness, um, but again, if I can please ask that both you and Mr. Cassidy keep your comments uh, as close to the script as possible for time. Oh. I know you're used to billing by the hour, but all of our time is valuable oh, here as well. I think you're up. Go John, so. Please go, please. Thank you. Dr. Mulhall, have you had a chance to review the voluminous medical records relating to the death of this unfortunate soul? I have. And do you have an opinion with a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to whether the defendant's diagnosis and treatment of Mr. Moore was appropriate and within standard of care? No, I do not. Uh, I believe Dr. Lindgren may have erred in diagnosing androgen deficiency. Furthermore, I think he paid insufficient attention to Mr. Moore's significant risk factors for cardiovascular disease and should have required Mr. Moore to obtain a cardiology or an internal medicine 
or family medicine consult before prescribing testosterone therapy. And if I could, Dr. Mulhall, just turn your chair a bit and talk to the jury, please. Forget that I'm here. Talk to the jury. Thank you. That's very difficult, Mr. Doff. I know it is. <clears throat> Let's break it down, sir. What's the basis for your belief that Dr. Lindgren may have misdiagnosed the androgen deficiency? I think there are three factors that um, I'm concerned about. First of all, I do not see anything in the medical records about adequate lab testing. Uh, the diagnosis was made on a single laboratory test, and therefore we, the variability in testosterone levels from test to test, I think it's mandatory per guidelines that more than one lab test is done. Secondly, I think there was no um, documentation about the timing of that test, and despite the fact that there's blunting of the circadian rhythm in older men, uh, I still believe that he should have had this documented that it was an early morning total testosterone level that was obtained. And thirdly, there's no indication what the assay is, and the CDC recommendations now are very clearly that LCMS, MS, liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectroscopy, is what should be used for the measurement of testosterone. So taking these three factors into account, I am not convinced that the patient had testosterone deficiency. So if the diagnosis of androgen or testosterone deficiency was wrong, then the prescription of testosterone was also wrong, correct? Yes. The uh, use of testosterone therapy is specifically aimed at patients who meet the diagnosis of testosterone deficiency. All right, let's assume for the moment that the diagnosis was accurate, even though you've told us it wasn't. And Mr. Moore was suffering from androgen deficiency. Did the defendant exercise reasonable medical judgment in prescribing androgen therapy to this patient? I'm not convinced that this was a medically sound decision under the circumstances. Would you, would you tell our jurors the reasons for that testimony, the basis? Well, firstly, Mr. Moore presented with a significant number of uh, risk factors for cardiovascular disease. He was obese with a BMI of 32, at least 80 pounds overweight. He had experienced type 2 diabetes due to his weight gain and sedentary lifestyle, and uh, most significantly had a family history of significant cardiovascular disease. Secondly, we know that there are studies, very recent studies, that indicate that testosterone therapy is associated with increased risk of cardiovascular events. So if Mr. Moore began testosterone therapy, he would be adding yet another risk factor uh, to those he already had. Thus, under these circumstances, Dr. Lindgren should have insisted that Mr. Moore be examined by a cardiologist or at least by an internal medicine physician before starting testosterone therapy. Now, you've heard the defendant and a Dr. Kara testify that the defendant reviewed the risks of testosterone therapy with the patient, including the cardiovascular risks. The defendant also said that he discussed the idea of Mr. Moore obtaining a cardiology consult. These physicians say that ultimately it was Mr. Moore's call to proceed with testosterone therapy in the face of these risks. What do you say, sir? You know, it's an interesting concept in medical practice. To what length should we go to to convince our patients to do what we believe to be the right thing? Frankly, it's difficult to believe that Dr. Lindgren truly stressed the risks of cardiovascular disease enough to make a real impact on Mr. Moore. I think if the patient had really understood the risks, I see no reason why he would have refused to obtain a cardiology consult. But it's ultimately the defendant's job to force the patient? Well, of course, we can't force our patients to make good decisions when it comes to their health, but we can certainly refuse to aid and abet their poor decisions. If I had been in Dr. Lindgren's shoes, I would have declined to prescribe testosterone therapy until such time as adequate and comprehensive cardiovascular risk stratification had been conducted by a certified internist or cardiologist. You've mentioned studies indicating that testosterone therapy has been associated with increased cardiovascular risk. Would you tell us about those studies, sir? There have been several papers published over the course of the last five or six years that support the concept that testosterone therapy uh, leads to cardiovascular events. First is a study by Basari et al. published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010. This is a randomized placebo-controlled study which showed 
increased hemoglobin and hematocrit levels, as well as decreased HDL, that's the good cholesterol, among patients taking testosterone. Most significantly, there were 23 adverse cardiovascular events in the testosterone treatment group compared to only five in those treated with placebo. Are there any additional studies that support your testimony today? Well, that was followed by the Weigand study, published in another very famous high-profile journal, JAMA, in 2013, which is widely cited for this uh, concept. This was a retrospective study looking at over 1,200 patients in the VA healthcare system who had been prescribed testosterone therapy after coronary angiography. In the study, the risk of cardiovascular events was 25.7% among the testosterone therapy patients compared to 199 in the control group. There are two other studies, one by Finkel, which compared patients who were on uh, testosterone with and without the use of a PD-5 inhibitor, and then by Zhu in 2013, both of which together add weight to the concept that testosterone therapy may in fact lead to increased cardiovascular event rates. So why is testosterone ever prescribed? Well, it can be a very effective and safe treatment for those suffering from testosterone deficiency who are in relatively good cardiovascular health. It's just not for everybody. And I would certainly not have prescribed it in a patient with as many existing cardiovascular risk factors as this patient. What about, sir, the time period after the testosterone was prescribed and taken? Did the defendant do enough, in your view, to monitor his patient, to see how his patient was doing on this potentially lethal drug? As a general rule in my testosterone therapy practice, the higher the risk the patient is for testosterone therapy, the earlier we'll see these patients. In this particular case, it's hard to say for certain because the patient's myocardial infarction occurred before his first scheduled follow-up visit, which was at three months after he began therapy. But that might be part of the problem. Dr. Lindgren could have asked Mr. Moore to come back for a follow-up exam earlier than three months. He would have then been able to assess Mr. Moore's testosterone level on therapy and check his hematocrit in an earlier fashion. The Endocrine Society guideline recommends that testosterone therapy be discontinued if the hematocrit rises above 54%, and we've no way of knowing what Mr. Moore's hematocrit was at the time he had his myocardial infarction. Are you saying the defendant should have been more proactive? He should have taken his head out of the sand? I think that's a fair statement. I think Dr. Lindgren could and probably should have done more to manage Mr. Testo Mr. Moore's testosterone use and known cardiovascular risks once the testosterone therapy had begun. And one final question. Tell our jurors what the downside would have been to telling this gentleman, please go and see a cardiologist. What's the downside? I can see none. No further questions. <clears throat> Doctor, the standard of care does not require that every patient uh, being given testosterone therapy receive a cardiac consult, correct? There exists no standard of care. Right. So the, the answer is no, that is not the standard of care, correct? We base these decisions Doctor, on guidelines. I can't answer the question yes or no. Can't answer that yes or no? So are you saying there is a standard of care that every patient on testosterone therapy be sent for a cardiac consult? We have guidelines. Okay. Just try the question, doctor. Are you saying every patient needs to be sent for a cardiac consult? I can't answer that question, yes or no. Okay. You can't or you won't? I cannot answer that question, yes or no. Okay. Now, let's talk about uh, your last point with Mr. Uh, Dopf about follow-up. Uh, wouldn't you agree, doctor, that the Endocrine Society guidelines for testosterone therapy in androgen-deficient men uh, recommend determining HCT at baseline at three months, at six months following initiation of testosterone therapy, and then annually thereafter? So I think this is a very important point for the jury to understand. So guidelines are developed based on evidence-based medicine using what's known as an index patient. And the index patient for the Endocrine Society guidelines published in 2010 and not yet republished is the male with hypogonadism in a relatively healthy state. There is nothing in there, cancer, that talks about the patient with high-risk cardiovascular disease. So the guidelines is not actually fully pertinent mm -hmm. to the individual patient in question. Doctor, guidelines in medicine very often distinguish between 
uh, so-called average risk patients and high risk patients, correct? In general, that's the case, but not on the case of the Endocrine Society guidelines from 2000. In fact, doctor, the truth is that the Endocrine Society guidelines do not state that there is any different guideline for a high-risk patient, correct? That's correct. Right. Now, let's talk about this whole concept of Mr. Moore being a high-risk patient. Uh, had Mr. Moore been diagnosed with cardiovascular disease, uh, prior to the time he came to Dr. Lindgren for treatment? Not to my knowledge. Had he experienced, to your knowledge, any significant cardiovascular adverse events? Not based on my review of the medical records. And you heard Dr. Lindgren testify that he did screen Mr. Moore for cardiac symptoms, correct? Uh, he did say that, yes. You would agree, doctor, uh, that he did the screening that he said he did, correct? I believe that he did what screening is done by the average urologist, yes. Okay. Uh, he's not trained in cardiology, and it's possible he may have missed something. And you're not trained in cardiology either, correct? That's 100% correct. And you don't know for a fact that Dr. Lindgren missed any sign of cardiovascular disease, do you? That's correct. Dr. Lindgren discussed a cardiology consult with Mr. Moore, correct? I believe he discussed that possibility, yes. Right. And you would agree with me, wouldn't you, doctor, that it is ultimately the patient's decision as to whether to uh, follow or not follow a discussion or a recommendation for a cardiology consult? I think that's, that's correct. I, I can't imagine Mr. Moore, however, would have decided against obtaining a cardiology consult, uh, had a full and comprehensive discussion of the cardiovascular risk being conducted. Doctor, is it your testimony here under oath that you have never had a patient do something different from what you were recommending? Oh, it happens all the time in routine clinical practice, but that doesn't force me into prescribing the therapy. Now, You've never uh, met Mr. Moore, correct? That's correct. And you never had any discussion with Mr. Moore, correct? That's correct. Um, so you have no personal knowledge as to uh, what was actually said in that room or what Mr. Moore understood while he and Dr. Lindgren were having that discussion, correct? That's correct. Um, now, with regard to your uh, let's talk about the prescription of the testosterone therapy. Mm -hmm. um, you would agree, doctor, that according to the FDA-approved labeling for testosterone uh, cipionate, uh, obesity is not a contraindication for that medication? That's correct. Okay. You would agree, doctor, that diabetes is not a contraindication for that medication? That's correct. And Family history of cardiovascular disease, doctor, you would agree that family history of cardiovascular disease is also not a contraindication for testosterone, correct? That's correct, but just because the single items are not listed as contraindications does not mean that collectively as a unit they don't weigh against prescribing testosterone therapy. Now, doctor, the Endocrine Society guidelines actually make recommendations against testosterone therapy in certain cases, correct? Yes, they do. For example, they recommend against testosterone therapy when patients have breast or prostate cancer or a PSA score greater than four, a crit above 50, uh, untreated severe sleep apnea, or severe lower urinary tract symptoms, correct? That's correct, but they also caution against testosterone therapy for patients experiencing some cardiovascular problems. But not patients with just any cardiovascular problems, correct? That's correct. Doctor, isn't it true that the guidelines specifically recommend against testosterone therapy for patients with, quote, uncontrolled or poorly controlled heart failure, close quote? I believe that to be correct. They don't say anything, doctor, about family history of cardiovascular disease or any sign of cardiovascular risk factors, correct? The guidelines don't mention those issues in particular. And in fact, uh, doctor, based upon your review, was Mr. Moore actually experiencing 
uncontrolled or poorly controlled heart failure at the time Dr. Lindgren prescribed the testosterone therapy. There was no indication the patient had heart failure per se. Now, regarding these studies that you've cited, doctor, regarding testosterone therapy uh, being associated with increased risk of cardiovascular events, uh, you would agree, doctor, that not all of the studies have uh, identified that same risk, correct? That is correct, but the majority of the most recent studies have done so. Some, doctor, but not all, correct? That's correct. And doctor, after the Vigan study that you had mentioned, did the FDA require a change in the labeling for testosterone cipionate? Yes. Does the revised labeling warn of significant risks of cardiovascular adverse events associated with the drug? I can't recall the exact wording of the warning. Doctor, isn't it true that the warning does not uh, address that? It doesn't uh, say anything about significant risks of cardiovascular adverse events associated with the drug. Again, I don't recall specifically, but that may be right. I know it also states that some studies have reported an increased risk of adverse cardiovascular events associated with the use of testosterone therapy. Doctor, in fact, in the approved uh, FDA revised labeling, what it states is that studies have been, quote, inconclusive, close quote, for determining the major, uh, excuse me, for determining the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events. Isn't that true? That's correct. Inconclusive, correct? Inconclusive, correct. And, doctor, as we just discussed a moment ago, the revised labeling did not add a contraindication for all types of cardiovascular risks or disease, correct? That's correct. And as you told us just a little while ago, at the time Dr. Lindgren saw this patient, uh, he had not been diagnosed with cardiovascular disease and had not experienced any significant uh, episodes or symptoms of cardiovascular disease, correct? Based on the medical record review, that's correct. Okay. Thank you, doctor. That's all I have. Uh, Mr. Cassidy, if you would yep. like to call your expert witness now. Uh, I will, Your Honor. Uh, we'd like to call Dr. Uh, Caro, please. Good afternoon, doctor. Good afternoon. Uh, doctor, uh, have you reviewed all of the medical records and materials in this case? Yes, I have. And based upon your review of those uh, records and materials, doctor, have you reached opinions to a reasonable degree of medical certainty with regard to Dr. Lindgren's diagnosis and treatment decisions uh, of the patient, Mr. Moore? Yes, Dr. Lindgren's diagnosis and management of hypogonadism was well within the standard of care. And, doctor, I think you uh, have a slide that you'd uh, like to show us uh, regarding why you think that's the case? Sure. There's four main points I'd like to present today. One, was this patient appropriately diagnosed and treated? Second, were there any warning or contraindications to suggest that TRT should not have been given to this patient? Third, is there any compelling data to demonstrate that TRT causes cardiovascular disease? And finally, is there data to suggest that TRT can improve risk factors for cardiovascular disease? Okay. Thank you, doctor. Let's take each of those points uh, one at a time. First, do you believe Dr. Lindgren appropriately diagnosed Mr. Moore uh, based upon the standard of care as suffering from androgen deficiency or low testosterone? Yes, I do. Dr. Lindgren accurately diagnosed this patient. According to the 2010 endocrine guidelines, a patient should have a serum testosterone level as an initial diagnostic screening test. That's exactly what Dr. Lindgren did. This patient's serum testosterone level was 210 nanogram per deciliter, well below the normal range. In addition, patients should have signs and symptoms such as low energy, low libido, erectile dysfunction, increased body fat. These are exactly the symptoms that Mr. Moore elicited. In other words, Dr. Lindgren made the right diagnosis. Okay. Now, <clears throat> turning to his treatment decisions, doctor, uh, do you have an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to whether Dr. 
uh, Lindgren complied with the standard of care in his decision to prescribe testosterone cypionate uh, at 200 milligrams. I do. This patient was appropriately treated. According to the endocrine guidelines, a patient must meet two criteria. They must have the signs and symptoms, and they must have a low serum testosterone level. Mr. Moore had both. He had long-standing erectile dysfunction that was not responding to PD-5 inhibitors, and treating him with testosterone was a reasonable option. Now, did Mr. Moore have any warning signs or contraindications for testosterone therapy? Mr. Moore did not have any warning signs or contraindications to testosterone therapy. Again, according to the 2010 endocrine guidelines, patients should not be treated with testosterone if they have breast cancer or known or suspected prostate cancer. Mr. Moore did not have breast cancer, and his PSA was only 2.4. In addition, the guidelines also warn against treating patients who have a hematocrit above 50 percent or uncontrolled heart failure. Mr. Moore did not have heart failure, and his hematocrit was only 45.2 percent. And, Doctor, if we look at the contraindications and warnings from the manufacturer uh, of the drug prescribed, the testosterone uh, cypionate, uh, do those raise any uh, red flag, so to speak, in Mr. Moore's case. These are the contraindications from the package insert from testosterone cypionate. If you look carefully, Mr. Moore did not have any of these contraindications. So if you read further on, it's appropriate that these patients are counseled about the risks of testosterone therapy prior to initiating therapy. That's exactly what Dr. Lingren did. He appropriately counseled this patient on the risks of testosterone therapy. Now. Let's talk for a moment, if we may, doctor, about the studies that prompted that warning. Um, there have been studies referred to already here uh, this afternoon. Can you briefly address those studies for us? Sure. The first is the Bessaria study, and this study is actually conducted in frail elderly men. The uh, cardiovascular was not an endpoint in this study. In fact, if you look at the MACE events, uh, they're far less than what the cardiovascular events were reported. Actually, there were four MACE events at the testosterone arm. There were zero in the placebo. And realize that none of these MACE events were actually adjudicated. Okay. Um, would you address, Doctor, the uh, Vigan study from JAMA in 2013, please? Sure. There are many concerns with this study as well. No randomization or placebo. There were concerns with the methodology and the statistics as well. In fact, patients that were treated with testosterone only had serum testosterone levels in the low 300s. Some would argue that's still subtherapeutic. There were two post-publications uh, uh, corrections as well. For example, one of the corrections was that they excluded 1,132 men, which really should have been 128 men. And what's more surprising is that in this all-male population, 10% of these patients were women. There was concerns about compliance, and there's also uh, so many concerns that 29 medical societies requested the retraction of this article, which was never done. Doctor, is there anything in the Vigan study that should have caused Dr. Lindgren to do something differently from what he did? <coughs> no, there's not. And l tell us, if you would, please, Doctor, your thoughts about the Finkel study. The Finkel study also is very concerning. There's no randomization. There's no placebo. In fact, there's no control group in this study. Uh, there's some concern about compliance with the medication. We don't even have post-testosterone levels to note even if these patients got into the therapeutic range. What's also surprising is that these patients were treated with testosterone for one year, but the authors only cho chose to present the data for the first 90 days. Okay. And the same question, doctor. Is there anything about the Finkel study that should have caused Dr. Lindgren to do something differently for Mr. Moore than what he did? No, there's not. And lastly, Doctor, the uh, ZOO study? The ZOO st article that Dr. Mohal presented has some concerns as well. First, no, it's not consistent with the other cardiovascular and testosterone studies that are published, meta-analysis that are published in the literature. If you, just two of the studies in this study comprise over a third of the patients, one being the Bessaria study. If you exclude these two studies, there's actually no difference at all between the placebo arm and the testosterone-treated arm in terms of cardiovascular events. And finally, for some reason, these authors chose to exclude studies that did not show any cardiovascular events. Doctor, 
Is there anything in any of these studies that we've discussed this afternoon that reliably show that testosterone therapy increases the risk for cardiovascular disease? No, there's not. So I would tell you this, that these studies are very similar and, and similar to what I believe as well as the FDA. As you recall, the FDA has stated that there's inconclusive evidence to support that testosterone therapy increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. And doctor, in fact, prior to 2010, was there support in the literature to reach a different view about the relationship between testosterone therapy and cardiovascular disease? Yes, there was. Prior to 2010, there were numerous articles demonstrating that low testosterone not only increases your risk for mortality, but also increases the severity and incidence of coronary artery disease. Furthermore, there were numerous studies at that time showing that giving testosterone replacement therapy to patients actually decreases your risk for cardiovascular risk factors, such as obesity, insulin resistance, and inflammation. <coughs> Doctor, does a person suffering from uh, low testosterone or, <coughs> excuse me, androgen deficiency share any risk factors with a person suffering from cardiovascular disease? Absolutely. So many of the same risk factors for hypogonadism are actually the exact same risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Obesity, insulin resistance, diabetes. In other words, these patients are much more likely to have a heart attack or a stroke whether you give them testosterone or not. Doctor, do you have an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to whether Dr. Lindgren complied with the standard of care of the average urologist in his care and treatment of Mr. Moore? I do. And would you please explain your reasons why, doctor? I do believe that this patient was appropriately diagnosed and treated. There was not any warning signs or contraindications to suggest that testosterone should have been given to this patient. There were no, no, there's no compelling data to demonstrate that TRT causes cardiovascular disease. And finally, there's no data to, there is data to suggest that testosterone can improve risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Dr. Lindgren's diagnosis and management of this patient was well within the standard of care. Thank you very much, Doctor. Can we agree, sir, that there was no downside to counseling this patient to see a cardiologist? Yes or no? No. Would you say that no just a little louder for us? No. Okay. <laughs> One of the articles cited by one of the pioneers on this subject matter, Dr. Mohal, was from the New England Journal of Medicine, correct? That is correct. That is the Rolls Royce of publications, isn't it? That, that's one's opinion. What do you think? It's a Ford or something? You don't think it's the Rolls Royce? I think it's, I think it's a good journal. And in looking through your curriculum vitae, I see you have no articles published from the New England Journal. That is correct. Could that be why you don't agree it's a Rolls-Royce of publications? I'll move on, Judge. I'll move on. Um, cardiovascular disease is often hereditary, isn't it? I'm not a cardiologist, but yes, it is possible. And that's the problem. You're not a cardiologist, and this gentleman is not a cardiologist, and that's the problem with this case, isn't it, sir? Yes or no? I cannot answer the question. Okay. And obesity is a significant risk. True? True. Likewise, onset of type 2 diabetes due to lack of exercise or diet is a significant risk factor. True? True. And Mr. Moore exhibited all of the three of these significant risk factors for cardiovascular disease. He was obese. He was on medication for early stage 2 diabetes and his father had suffered an MI at a relatively young age. True? Yes, that is correct. And do you know when his father suffered that MI? Do I know when he suffered? Yeah, how old was he? 52 years of age. And cardiovascular disease may be asymptomatic. In other words, a person could be experiencing significant strain or damage to his heart over time, even though he hasn't had an MRI, an MI, 
or a major cardiac event, true? Again, I'm not a cardiologist, but yes, it is possible. And that's why the patient should have been referred to a cardiologist, true? True? I cannot answer the question. Speaking of not being a cardiologist, is Dr. Lindgren a cardiologist? He is not. And when Mr. Moore came to see the defendant, the defendant noted the presence of these risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Did the defendant refer Mr. Moore to a cardiologist before, before prescribing the medicine, the testosterone? Dr. Lingeren did discuss with Mr. Moore that seeing a cardiologist would be useful. Move to strike. Answer my question. Did he refer the patient to a cardiologist? He did not. He could have done so, correct? Yes, he could have, but it's not typical in this case. So you don't think it's typical for a urologist to advise a patient with significant cardiovascular risk factors to see a cardiologist before starting a new medication that may cause a heart attack. Is that what you're telling us? I do think it's appropriate to refer to a cardiologist if you think that a patient has occult cardiovascular disease, whether you're prescribing testosterone or not. I don't think it's appropriate to refuse medication to a patient who understands the risk benefits of the medication and still wishes to proceed. So just leave it up to the patient. In this case, when the physician explains the risks to the patient and the patient understands those risks, uh, yes. And are you telling our jurors that patients always understand the risks that their physicians describe to them? I can't say they always understand, but in this case, there's no reason to believe that Mr. Moore did not understand the risks that Dr. Lingren presented to him. You never spoke to Mr. Moore, did you? That is true. That's because he's dead, correct? So you can't speak to what he did or didn't understand based on a conversation with the defendant, true? I can't speak definitively on Mr. Moore's understanding, but I can speak on Dr. Lindgren's testimony, which he states he clearly explained the risks of this testosterone therapy. Moreover, Dr. Lindgren had a signed consent form, which also stated the risks of testosterone therapy. You've testified about a number of studies this afternoon. Is it fair to say that the Weigand study, Finkel study, and others at least suggest the possibility that testosterone therapy is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular disease? My belief is consistent with the FDA, which also stated that there is inconclusive evidence to support that testosterone causes increased risk for heart attack or stroke. That wasn't my question, sir. My question is, do these studies suggest a possibility of increased risk of cardiovascular disease among those who use testosterone therapy? If you're asking me about possibility and not probability, then yes, anything's possible. And one way to safeguard a possibility would have been to send this patient to the cardiologist, true? Or you can't answer that either? I can't answer that question. If we're talking about possibilities, not probabilities, strike that. Androgen deficiency and erectile dysfunction are not a life-threatening condition, are they? They can be debilitating and lead to more serious conditions, but in and of themselves, they're not life-threatening. And were there other treatment options that the defendant could have recommended? Well, the patient had failed PD-5 inhibitors. Theoretically, I suppose Dr. Lingeren could have prescribed alprostadil, but in a patient who has low testosterone and has failed PD-5 inhibitors, testosterone therapy is an appropriate, reasonable choice. But alprostadil was at least an option, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And are there cardiovascular risks associated with alprostadil? There are some patients that have experienced adverse cardiovascular events with alprostadil, but these are extremely rare. Nothing further. Thank you. Mr. Doff, if you would like to give your very brief closing statement. At I this would, point. Judge. As I stand here, jurors, I hope that you are strong enough and honest enough and decent enough to lay aside your affections and your prejudice for a fellow urologist.
What happened here was preventable. It didn't have to happen. And what the defense has done in this case is nothing more than a wicked attempt, an unholy attempt to subvert justice. You jurors have been a witness to a deliberate, orchestrated effort to deprive this family of justice. I'm honored beyond belief, jurors, to speak for this patient. I look forward to this moment, this summation. As soon as I learned about this case, as soon as I learned that someone had been injured like this, Mr. Moore came to the defendant hoping for treatment for his erectile dysfunction. The defendant performed a physical examination, took Mr. Moore's medical history, and ran standard lab tests. But then he proceeded to discount what the examination and history showed. He discounted that his patient was obese. He discounted that his patient was experiencing fatigue <coughs> and a sedentary lifestyle. He discounted that his patient was on medication for type 2 diabetes and he discounted that there was a family history of cardiovascular disease. Under these circumstances, the defendant should not have prescribed testosterone therapy for Mr. Moore without <coughs> first obtaining cardiac clearance. Defendant's own so-called expert admitted that there was no downside to a cardiology consult. Mr. Moore isn't a physician. He heard that testosterone could potentially restore his sexual function, and he jumped at the chance. But the defendant knew, or at least he should have known, he should have known better. He knew about the studies indicating that testosterone therapy may be associated with it increased risk of adverse cardiovascular events. He knew that his patient already had several risk factors for cardiovascular disease, and he knew or should have known that an experienced cardiologist would be in a better position to evaluate Mr. Moore's existing cardiac health and the risk that testosterone therapy might pose to him. It's true that the defendant may not have been able to compel the patient to see a cardiologist. Not everyone follows doctor's recommendations. But a definitive recommendation or referral, which is lacking here, could have made all the difference in the world. It might have changed, it would have changed Mr. Moore's mind had he gone to a cardiologist and it would have persuaded him not to undertake this risky therapy for the purpose of getting an erection. He would have never traded an erection for death. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the jury. This is a classic case of the crystal ball. The plaintiff knows that Mr. Moore died, and he wants you to look at everything, all of the evidence, through that prism. A prism that Dr. Lindgren didn't have available to him, a prism that Mr. Moore didn't have available to him. Ask yourselves this question, if you would, while you're deliberating. Is it reasonable to suggest, as the plaintiff has suggested here, that Mr. Moore, an averagely intelligent adult male, was not aware that he was at increased risk for cardiac disease, having had a father who had an MI at age 52? The fact of the matter is that Mr. Moore discussed with Dr. Lindgren whether or not to go to see a cardiologist. Dr. Moore, excuse me, Mr. Moore elected not to do that. And that is his right. And 
you know, it, it's a funny thing in these uh, so-called informed consent cases because doctors are damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. If they tell the patient what to do, then they're being paternalistic and denying the patient his or her right to make an informed choice. But if the patient makes the wrong choice in retrospect, and only in retrospect, then it's the doctor's fault for not being paternalistic. Dr. Lindgren followed the appropriate standards. This patient did not have active cardiovascular disease. He did not have symptomatic cardiovascular disease. And all doctors know, whether they're cardiologists or not, that patients who are asymptomatic are not appropriate candidates for stress tests. They're not appropriate candidates for catheterization. And please consider this as you're deliberating, and I'll close on this. You heard an awful lot from the plaintiff in this case about getting a cardiology consult. But did you hear one syllable, one single syllable, telling you that a cardiologist would have counseled the patient not to have the testosterone therapy. You did not. Dr. Lindgren did the right thing. Mr. Moore, unfortunately, had a bad outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes case two.